Hey guys, thank you for joining the Great Dynamics Podcast with your host Ahmed Hassan here. I just wanted to take a quick moment before we go into the podcast itself. Today I'm speaking to Alcon S2, which is an alias, that's not his real name. Alcon is still active duty intelligence analyst and he still holds uh, security clearances in New Zealand. So that's why he's using an alias. Thank you guys so much and enjoy the podcast. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Great Dynamics podcast again. My name is Ahmed Hassan. Today, I have, as always, a very interesting guest, Alcorn S2. Alcorn is from New Zealand. He's a Kiwi. As they say, he started his career as a military intelligence analyst. And right now, he works on the civilian side of government, and he's an intel analyst there. Thank you for joining us, Alcon. Hey, mate. Thanks for having me. Um, pleasure to be here. Enjoyed the last podcast that you did, and yeah, I'm glad to be a guest here. Thank you. Alcon, can you give me a, an overview of how you got into this line of work and where it all started? Uh, yeah, so I started... Um, in the military. I wasn't always intelligence though. I started actually working with logistics. However, that wasn't really for me. And I think just over halfway through my career, I decided to make the change to intelligence as that was kind of where my interests and my passions uh, were more suited. And and then I, I took the plunge based off uh, my own interests and some peer pressure from a couple of my friends and and I didn't. I haven't looked back since. So once I went through all the the intelligence schooling through the New Zealand Army, I deployed, and then I ended up working with New Zealand Special Operations, supporting a bunch of things there. And then once I finished that time, I moved back to the School of Military Intelligence, spent a short time there, and decided that I've had enough with the military, um, and I wanted to go take my skills to the public sector, and that's kind of where I am now. Um, not really involved and national security anymore, more on the peripheral of that. However, I think the job that I'm doing now has kind of opened me up uh, to more skills and the challenge of taking my intelligence tradecraft and applying it to a different problem set. And it's also freed me up to pursue some other initiatives that that I've got on, especially around the Allcom brand and everything I'm trying to set up there. So so yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'm still bound by a number of NDAs, so I can't really go into specifics. So I think throughout the podcast, I was talking general terms. Yeah, completely understood. What what made you decide to leave the army? What was the the reasoning behind that? Uh, so I think it's just it was just that time for me. Uh, the New Zealand Army had just gone through the whole uh, COVID nineteen and supporting the government uh, with the pandemic. Uh, and then at the back end of that, I just kind of looked at where the army was and where the military was and where the military was going, and it kind of just didn't align with my own goals and interests anymore. But I was also taking a toll on, on my family life, and it was just time for me to to take the foot off the gas, so to speak, and 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 try something new. And it was just it was just time. So that's kind of why I left. I'm still engaged uh, through the reserves, but that's yeah, that's kind of just on the side. Um, but yeah. All right. Interesting. What are, what are difficulties or, or focus areas for New Zealand military or military intelligence in general? It's the focus areas in terms of? Yeah. I mean, all threats. I mean, maybe that's the better way of, of asking the right. question. Yeah. So just by nature of where our government has reorientated and the strategy documents and, uh, the defense strategy that's come out recently. It's all centered on the Pacific and uh, the competition that's happening around there, especially with the likes of China and the West, the climate change and the effects of that and how it's going to impact Southwest Pacific nations. Um, so that's that's kind of where the main threat is. And then looking more global, it was orientated in the Middle East. And however, we've kind of pulled back from that part of the uh, part of the globe and now we've re- reorientated back into uh, the Pacific. I saw the other day that the prime minister was scheduled to travel to China. I think that that mm. fits in within the new strategy. What is your opinion on that? So I try not to get too opinionated on New Zealand politics. And I've, I've said this before, and I say it publicly, but 
the New Zealand government, we tread a fine line between supporting China and or denouncing China because they, they are the country's biggest trade partner. And without them, our economy would essentially go bust. So we, we're on a tightrope, really. We align with the West, but also we have to maintain our economic links with China. So when you listen to the prime minister and our politics, when they address China, it's really important to listen to the language. Um, they'll talk about China being assertive in the Pacific, but they won't necessarily go as far to say China is being aggressive or escalating tensions and things like that. Yeah. I think that we have to look at politics and, 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 and policy through a realistic lens. Every country does that. So, yeah. So that's obviously the, like the political side of things, but I think, you know, a lot of the country are more wary of what's happening in the region, especially when you talk to military types and, and people that are involved in national security and, and that kind of um, community. Everyone's got their own opinion, obviously, and I probably won't share what people think, but yeah, I think you can guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I have a good idea on that. And what, what's your opinion on what's now going on with the US, Nancy Pelosi, visiting Taiwan and mm. China's role? So the, the last I saw from what I've been monitoring, China, they started conducting their exercises in vicinity of Taiwan uh, in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, a bunch of joint military exercises, which was expected. I don't foresee military action against Taiwan as a result of the visit. I think China is too smart for that, especially when they're talking about their ambitions and their goals for the future. Um, to start a war with, well, I think America would be dragged into it, by nature of the visit and where they've positioned some of their carrier strike groups, it's not prudent for them to do that now. But there certainly is a lot of escalation, a lot of rhetoric, a lot of posturing to kind of send a message at least. Um, if it was to kick off, uh, they I forget the um, the name of the islands, but they've, Taiwan's essentially got an island quite, quite close to the Chinese mainland. Yeah, it would make more sense and... Reminds me a little bit of, I mean, it's not the same, but uh, if, if we're going to compare, everybody's looking at Russia and Ukraine, a Crimea type situation, yeah. not in a similar strategy of the way they, they would do it, but that would be a message by taking yeah. those islands and... Uh, yeah, and, I, and certainly in the, in the social media space, everyone has kind of pivoted onto the Chinese Taiwan problem set as well. It yeah. seems to be the hot topic now. Which, which is good. It means that I don't kind of have to cover it because that's kind of what I what I did. <laughs> and now I can yeah, just yeah. kind of do so, do some other things, which is, which is good. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting how how people become overnight experts in different conflicts or, or different yeah. situations around the globe. I've seen the memes of people switching hats all of a sudden. They are a security expert. And I think both of us know a lot of them, so yeah. I won't go too deep into that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It kind of just makes me wonder um, the backgrounds of some of the people. You know, people most like I guess a lot of people run these pages as as hobbies, and they might not even have a, a background in that mm. specific area or, or journalism or anything. But like that. yeah, it's interesting at least, I, I suppose. I think a lot of people start out that way, and I think it's really good that there is a, a very healthy and diverse ecosystem of people mm. sharing their analysis or their views or their opinions on these things. And it's not centralized by a couple of large corporations. I think it's very difficult to do fact checking. If you are just one guy with an account, it's, it's very difficult to do yeah. that, but but I think we need it. And sadly, that opinion is not shared by mm. Meta, Instagram yep. uh, in particular, by what we see in, in, in censoring. And sadly, because there needs to be a, a, a marketplace of ideas or different yeah. ideas and not focusing around, you know, what works for one side or another. Yeah, but yep. I don't know if we, we, we're going to make a lot of changes during the podcast, but I think it's important for people to know that even though these accounts may not have the right backgrounds that you and I have, 
I do think that there is a their place for them and uh, the tradecraft side of things. Like how do you vet your sources and, and what sources do you use? And I think there is a lot of improvement that could be had. But outside of that, I think uh, the speed, for example, where somebody shares a Twitter video or a Weibo video from China is yep. incredible. I mean, uh, yeah. the traditional legacy media is a little bit behind the curve on, on those topics. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I totally, I fully see that. And a good thing for me with a, a military intelligence background who's since left that small community, it's allowed me to stay engaged uh, in that kind of, um, on that problem set and kind of still stay engaged with the wider military intelligence community because it still is a passion of mine. And to let that go after leaving the military, it was I kind of missed it, and so this, that kind of also keeps that keeps that alive for me. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I do see the value in it, and I, it, the, just the engagement and the connection you can have uh, with some of the people out there, it's it's definitely broader than what you'd experience if you're working inside the IC for you know a government agency where your where your network uh, can be quite limited. Um, mm-hmm especially if you're working in an organization with you know with a hierarchy and you have to request certain authorities to go and talk to different people whereas here i mean i've got 10,000 potential people i can just go message so to speak you know as an example mm-hmm. um, so it's good in that respect but you you never know the credibility of someone though so that's the trade off yeah i think also that uh, OSINT is very popular today for the people that don't know what OSINT is open source intelligence I have to say my, my personal opinion is it's majority is open source information and not intelligence, yep. but I, I see a lot of experts and, and courses and, and I would love to hear what you think of that, of that community and, and what's out there, what's good about it. What's it's not so good. Yeah. So, um, so with your first point. I definitely agree that a lot of it is open source information, especially when you've got people all over the internet just pumping out bits of information, but there's no so what, there's no analysis to back it up or to provide context or meaning to it. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, people, a lot of people, they go online just to get information. They don't necessarily care about analysis, but for someone like you you and I, that's what matters. So in a lot of respects, that's what's lacking out there. And then, uh, I know with you know with Grey Dynamics and and what I do, I at least try to put some sort of analysis, even though it's quite um, hard and fast. And first line, it's still something. In terms of OSINT as a trade craft and how it's taught, it's been a while since I've done a, an OSINT, a formal OSINT course. And when I was doing it, it was a few years ago. It was mostly covered off like what the internet is manage distribution principles how to how to hide in the noise so to speak um, and then talking about a few online tools you can use to to do different bits and pieces but ozen as a tradecraft has since evolved so much in, in a short space of time especially when you move into the realm of cyber and coding and using scripts pulled off github someone coming you know fresh into the intelligence community who might not have a background in that kind of thing I think that's what needs to be taught, at least those kind of fundamentals. To be a really effective OSINT practitioner, you do need to have those kind of baseline, not just knowing what the internet is and how to stay safe on the internet. It's more than that now. Yeah, and I couldn't have said it better. We're both very active in the online space and you're mainly active on on Instagram. We are also very active on Instagram and Twitter, Mm. LinkedIn or whatnot. But in that space, what, what do you feel is lacking because is what I'm trying to put a finger on. Mm, yeah, it's it's hard to say what's lacking. For me, it was this is just my personal opinion, and this is the whole reason why I started all Connie's too. It was it was the analysis part. It was actually someone with an intelligence background providing a so what or meaning to what's happening in the world. When you've got these big uh, social media presence. Um, some of the accounts that we've talked about in the past, yeah. you know, even even those kind of accounts, they're just open source information. There's nothing to provide meaning to what even they're posting. Yeah. So that's what was lacking, and that's still lacking. And then in terms of a problem set, 
for me, it was my area of the world that was lacking. And that's the whole reason why I started All Colonies too. So I could keep my knowledge up in, in the Southwest Pacific. And yeah, for me personally, that's what was lacking. In terms of like the wider community and intelligence having a, a presence in the social media space, it's it's so it's hard for me to say at the moment um, because it's, it's still kind of new to me. I've only been doing that for about six months now. So yeah, yeah. it's a hard one. What do you think? We've always used social media as an extension on reporting on our website. So mm. pretty much the same as you. Say in the last six months, we pivoted and started creating products and posts that are not reflected on the website and stand alone. I think my personal opinion on what is missing is how we think about information and extension intelligence. I think the the so what question is probably the most important thing, but I think what's missing, not just in social media, but I see in a lot of like internet discourse around intelligence and information is critical thinking. Yeah. Right. There are tons of subject matter experts, uh, with huge followings and, and they do a great job. And I speak to a lot of these individuals, often very young people, and they ask, how do I pivot into uh, make this a career? Or I hear complaints about, well, I've written this, or I've created this, I found this in a dark corner on the internet and somebody else just took it, put it into a report and, you know, I didn't get credit. And what I say is then, what did you do? Did you add value to the information that you found? Because then you can call it intelligence. But if it's just, you put a label on it and you just basically process this for an analyst that then can use it in their wider analysis. And the other side is obviously, you know, there's a, a, a very large set that is the memification of intelligence yeah. online, right? Yeah. Which is fun. You know, I'm not yeah. going to say it's not, but it's fun and it's, it's interesting to see. And I share them with, with colleagues and, and people either still in the intelligence communities. But I think for me, that's, that's one thing that is, that is lacking. But I do appreciate the creativity. I do appreciate how they find these pieces, these little nuggets. I saw that you, Oato, and Little Minds are, are doing something together. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, firstly, shout out Bulletin from the Borderlands. Just a shameless plug there. If you haven't subscribed, I highly recommend. And so, I guess the the premise around that. It was essentially one of the key things that's missing in military intelligence or military as a whole is intelligence and the things you need to know in your area of operations. That kind of information isn't always accessible to the lower ranks. So it's typically the the intel briefs and intel updates are given to leaders and commanders and people who need to know. But from our perspective, it's important for everyone to kind of have that awareness as well for a number of reasons. So that's the whole um, purpose kind of behind the bulletin from the borderland. It enables us to provide analysis on important things happening in different parts of the world, which is, it's focused on, or I guess the audience that it, that it's intended for are those lower rank people and the soldier or the officer on the ground who might not necessarily have a good awareness of his his surroundings, the AO that he's operating in. So that's where we headed, and I think we're doing well so far. Straight off the bat, we got maybe 49 to 50 subscribers, paid to subscribers uh, for the first edition, and um, which is good. And we're slowly slowly getting subscribers as we go. We've just released our second newsletter, and we've had nothing but good feedback, which which is cool. So yeah, again, if you haven't signed up and you're interested in, in what's happening around the world from some really good writers, Bulletin from the Borderlands. And I think in the in the coming one, we will have some input into that one too. And whatever we can do to to help people like yourselves. And, you know, I, I say compatriots, less competition, more compatriots. Yeah. Because I think also there's another thing that what you guys do really well 
is you identified an audience and you you stick to that and I think it's very commendable. I mean, already fifty paying subscribers. That's a really good job. So Yeah. Yeah. So that's um that's one of the things we've got going on and and then I, on the side, I've still got my own uh, thing I'm trying to stand up as well, which is, you know, a newsletter, which is, it's free, you know, and people are subscribing to that, which is good. And that's something that's really blown me away from the social media itself. And then having subscribers subscribe to a mailing list where every week they'll get some of my own intelligence product focus on the Indo-Pacific. And it's kind of stuff that I wouldn't release on Instagram or, or wherever else, it's, it's straight to the mailbox. So nearly at uh, 500 subscribers there, which is good. And it's uh, slowly growing, growing that, that awesome. presence and that following. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. I mean, that's fantastic uh, to hear. And I think for people listening, they're not following uh, Alcom as to uh, newsletter, please go and do it. What are your, your plans for maybe after government or your current job? Yeah. Yeah, so I would I would love to to take whatever I'm doing now and turn it into a you know a paying career because I'm still passionate about the intelligence community and military intelligence and and all uh, that it encompasses, but I'm not passionate about the military anymore. You know, so mm. it's kind of hard <laughs> if I want to stay involved in that and not be in the military unless I want to go work for a, a civilian agency. But as I get, you know, as I get further into my life and with my personal life, it's kind of hard for me to justify those kind of jobs. Mm. Especially, you know, when you when you're working for the government, you get sent all around the all around the show and doing different bits and pieces, and it can be a lot of a long time from from home. So, to be able to do that myself with developing the Orcon brand, and I'm, I really I really like what Grey Dynamics does, and I, I really want to kind of model what you guys have done, but turn it into my own thing in this part of the world yeah. not to try steal your business no, no, no. <laughs> but I, I definitely take a lot of inspiration from what you guys do and, and especially visiting your website and you kind of get a good idea and and what you guys put out is exactly what you know I'm, I'm passionate about as well so if I can do that something like that too then that's a win for me yeah and and for and for the people listening um actually you are I mean, I, I, I know you will know this, but I give out information and how we do things very freely, you know, to the people in our circle. You're one of the few people that actually like listens to my advice and it worked. So I'm really happy to hear that our journey has been a very long one. And I think what is what was for us was very interesting is that we saw when we started doing this, we thought that the website and the social media stuff was just a way to get leads, you know, to do our yeah. offline work. And mm -hmm. I think now we are at a place that our offline work will probably sooner rather than later will be less important for the company as mm. the online stuff that we're doing. I mean, yep. if I look at the, the subscribers and the amount of uh, readership that we have at the moment on the website, that has, that has grown to a point that, that it surprised me. And, yeah. and I think I had to like step out of my intelligence way of thinking and seeing the world and integrate maybe more of internet culture. Into, yeah, yeah. into what we do, right? So yep. I've learned from the, some of the more younger people how to effectively shit post and incorporate maybe here and there, not not overly, but but some memes here and there. And, and like, how do we engage with a younger audience too? And uh, I think people will be mm. surprised to know how young some of our peers are yep. in that space. Yeah. But I'm super happy that I can give information so that people that, that, that want to do similar things that they don't have to go to the, yeah, to the nonsense that we had to yeah. uh, go through.
Yeah, and that's the thing. I'm not. I'm not the type of person uh, that will reinvent the wheel if someone's giving me good advice, especially if it's from someone who's done something that I want to do, and they you know they've been successful at it. So that's kind of my mentality. You know, and I've got other friends as well who have done similar things, and they've kind of flipped it. So they started on social media, and then went into the business realm, and they built a community on social media first, and then and then started monetizing and, and doing all different bits and pieces. So. It's just kind of taking the best advice I can get and, and try and grow what I'm doing. But in terms of intelligence, you know, one of my key things when, when people sign up to uh, my mailing list, one of the key things is, is what I'm trying to do is just take intelligence, you know, bring it out of the shadows because it's still got that mystique, you know, people uh, attribute it to the cloak and daggers and that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. it's it, you know, when you look at the definition of intelligence, it's literally just um, – you processed information and providing meaning to information and it's just and that's all it is but you know when you intelligence is quite still a scary word for a lot of people so just trying to kind of lift those barriers and and that kind of thing tell me about it i think a lot of what you do really well better than most is education how you talk about intelligence as not just as the products but as a process and what is it about and, and, and why we use these terms. And I think when people understand that, they they gravitate more towards, you know, what you have to say instead of like how you say it. And, and I have to commend you for that. I think you are one of the more sharper people out there that's, that's giving it out. And I think a lot of people call themselves intelligence providers wrongly, but mm. if they tweak it a little bit, I mean, they would be on the, on the right path. Are you aiming with Alconis to, to, to do offline work? To provide yeah, services so, to clients? Yeah, I would love to do that at some point. Um, it's just a matter of breaking into that market or New Zealand. I'm not even sure that market really exists. So it would be more of a case of doing it for offshore kind of companies and, and enterprises. But... Yeah, I would eventually like to do that, but staying online at the moment is kind of where I can focus and commit my time and my resource. But okay. cheers for the kind words, though. I yeah, really appreciate it. Eh? <laughs> that means I a lot. deserve it, man. I don't know if we and I have talked about this before, but I think the online side is far more the future than the offline. Yeah. And, and I love that you said that you're trying to take the mystique around it a, a bit away from it. I think a lot of people yeah. lead into that. Right, I think to their own detriment because it could be so much more valuable if more people can engage with it instead of like yeah. keeping it hidden or only a certain amount of people can do it type of view. And I think one thing that we want to do as as great dynamics is something that we've been building now for a while and if we've been testing it is. Mm to offer training to young people or people that are already right. in intelligence and something that you and I talked about. And what do you think people should learn or could benefit from learning around intelligence? So I think if, just say you're, you're a grad student, you're fresh out of, out of uni, you've gone from high school straight to university and you're looking to break into intelligence. I think it's worthwhile perhaps taking a break before entering the intelligence community possibly traveling or or doing a job that gets you exposure to the world before coming back and going into the intelligence community where more often than not you, you probably w- will be working on an international problem set or a problem involving a different culture than your own um, so I, I think there's a lot, a lot of merit in doing that rather than going from you know, high school, uni, into intelligence community. Although, you know, I've worked with, with many graduates and, and they're, they're great people and they've got a lot to offer. But in my personal experience, I just think that there's a lot of value in doing that. In terms of someone, you know, who's made the made the decision, they're going to enter the intelligence community regardless of where they are at life. I think there's a, a thing to be said about managing expectations um, because people will have, you know, an idea, yeah, an idea of, or, or a, an image of what intelligence are working in the intelligence community is, and then once they get in there, it, it might not, you know, it might not um, meet their expectations, especially if they're expert or they are so a so-called expert on a certain um, thing, 
and they might not even get to work on that that thing that they're knowledgeable about right they might get pushed into somewhere else and then they have to come back and do um and do what they want to do so yeah it's just about managing expectations a lot of the time it's not it's not what's in the movies um Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i think a lot of people yeah should probably realize that it's a lot of a lot of meetings a lot of sitting behind a computer and just pulling information um but at the same time, if you've got the, the right attitude and the right personality to be that kind of analyst, then then that's good too. Um, and one other thing, um, I've gone on a bit of a tangent note here, but oh, another thing that, Love them. that really, really stuck out with me um, when I went uh, moved into the intelligence community was you still need to be able to interact with people. There's a misconception, right, with intelligence analysts. They're just going to go into a, a secure room get behind the computer and just start typing away and and looking at data and and networks and all this kind of stuff but it's not it certainly isn't the case because if you're the analyst you're not necessarily the sensor and to get information from some certain sensors you know those that kind of information could be coming from a person and you might have to go talk to that person to try get some sort of information and if you don't have if you're not personable or anything like that you can't relate to people or even hold a conversation then you're kind of yeah, you're missing a lot, a key a key attribute uh, attribute of an intelligence practitioner. And that's not even human. I mean, that's not even being a, a human mm. collector or a source handler. That's just literally talking to someone who might know something. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Or even just fight, or fighting for information, you know, fi- figuring out what you need to do, what you need to know. It's all that kind of stuff. Great point. I think that's, that's actually, that's not said enough that how much of being an analyst you need to talk to other people, but I also yeah. think like you need to be a team player because you yeah. don't do it by yourself. Often you're yep. part of a wider team. And I think that's very important to be able to communicate with peers and, and think as part of a larger group, but not just, you know, I'm just doing yeah. this on my own. I think people would be surprised by how much is done as a team and there's not many analysts that do things by themselves. Yeah. The only time I've ever done things by myself is when we're like limited on people <laughs> and mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm, you're forced to do it by yourself, but that's not usually the case. You've usually, I've got a small team of people and, and yes, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of teamwork that goes into um, developing intelligence product and even doing some really robust analysis It involves a team because it removes biases and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Which again, that's also is not talked about enough, the biases. And I don't know what your opinion on that is. Biases in, in Yeah, the- I think I think as an analyst, number one, maybe number two lesson is how do you combat yeah. biases, you know, structured analytic techniques and all that stuff. How do you see that particularly in the in the online space, in the social media space that that we're active it, in? I think you touched on it um earlier. It just comes down to critical thinking for starters being able to take information and just pulling the facts out of it and keeping your your biases away from it and just yeah, looking at the facts, critically analyzing them and coming to some sort of conclusion that doesn't lean towards one way. It's, a, it's just a reflection of what you've read. But again, that's hard to do if you're by yourself and yeah. you're not necessarily, you don't necessarily come from an intelligence background or even a, a research and analysis background if you're just you know some some guy who does it as a hobby there's a massive risk of you know of letting your biases influence what you're doing and i, I kind of see that a lot online especially when it comes to politics and u.s politics yeah. there's always there's always seems to be an agenda with with a lot of people and those are the accounts that i, I don't tend to follow that much but yeah you, you definitely see it in that respect sorry if we're going back and forth back and forth it, that non-linear way of thinking is kind of like a little bit to a detriment to myself. In some, in mm. some cases, it works out for me in, in yep. work. Maybe not as much in communication, but yep. I haven't even asked you about your youth, you know, where did you grow up and, you know, and, and, and how did that, if anything, affect where you are today in life, particularly in, in the street? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I didn't have a... I just, you know, grew up middle class New Zealand, just a, a quite a normal upbringing. And I think the biggest thing that has shaped how I operate now was my life before coming into the intelligence community 
with logistics and the military and having those kind of exposures and operating with those kind of people. And just having a different view on the world, because I did a bit of travel before I came into the intelligence community and I, and I did a bunch of different things and worked with so many different people that I had I had a pretty good understanding and a good and a different way of looking at things. And that's what it comes down to, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it just comes down to having a different way of looking at things, having a different way of looking at a problem. And I definitely think that the job I did before coming into the intelligence community really helped with that. I don't, I don't necessarily think my upbringing and you know my just my personal life had an impact on how i how i go about my business but yeah i i, I certainly think it's it's what i did before the intelligence community when i was in the military that that really helped me today what are places for you that you feel have had that impact to you where you traveled mm. so yeah definitely Definitely in the Middle East to Afghanistan. That was an eye opener for me. So that was the first big deployment that I did, and to go into that environment and interact with some of those people, but also interact with our coalition partners, and having that first exposure to Five Eyes and, and all that kind of stuff. That was that was a big one for me. And then coming back and just being able to operate all around the the Pacific and experience those cultures and having that understanding and now. Or in a previous, in, when I was in military intelligence, having that appreciation for the AO that I'm focusing on and focusing my work towards, having actually been there, it really, it really helped. Yeah, broaden my understanding and and really deep dive some things. Interesting. And I think because what I'm trying to unravel here is, is there anything that that somebody that wants to join? I mean, you talked about it a bit already, but is there anything somebody that wants to come into this industry outside of understand or trying to understand the world more and travel is there anything else that you say is important for them to pay attention to so i think it's in terms of a skill it's it's definitely writing that's a big one because i was, I was guilty of it i came into the intelligence community and you know i started writing my first reports and they were more like academic essays, which was I think is a common problem for a lot of people, and I quickly got that got that out of me. So, kind of focus on analytical report writing, stating the facts. But outside of that, it's definitely it's watch watch the news, start getting your head around current events in the world, and not looking at what's happening, but looking at why things are happening. Start looking to the histories of cultures, of borders, geopolitics, that kind of thing. So yeah, that the real important message there is the reason why things around the world happen, not what's happening in the world. Yeah, I think we all agree on that one. So you, yeah. you made some 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 good points there. And uh, what I always try to get a feel for is, are you reading something at the moment? And if so, what are you reading? Yeah, so I'm rereading a, a book called Deep Work uh, by Cal Newport. It's essentially how to maximize your time and remove distractions from um you know from when you're doing some really heavy intellectual work and i think it's really important for people in jobs like ourselves or people who write uh, for a living or or code or, or do anything that involves your brain to really get your hands on a book like that and i've always said to anyone who asks me about self-help books it's literally the only self-help book i will ever recommend is deep work because a bit of backstory you know I don't have a lot of time these days to spend on things. So Mm -hmm. to have the skill on like intense concentration and short periods, like 30 minutes to an hour with no distractions, I feel like I can do more in an hour than most people can do in six hours. Yeah. And that's a key one is deep work by Cal Newport. And it's the only self-help book I'll ever recommend. I stand by. Interesting. All right. And I know the book, I've read it, and I can echo that. What about maybe not self-help books or more either fiction or something you, you do you read for enjoyment? I I, I used to, I don't anymore, but specific, and that's purely because I read for a living. <laughs> mm, <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, so I, I need, I, and, I, and now that I've got this other stuff going on outside of my work life, it's just more reading. So 
yeah. I try to, I try to, sometimes I just need some mind numbing entertainment just to take my mind mm. off things. Or, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you said to it perfectly to my next question. What is, what yeah. else, you know, like, are you watching something interesting or, uh, or podcast even uh, that you're listening to? Yeah. So I'm really enjoying the little niche podcast that people are, are plugging on social media at the moment, especially in the community that we kind of follow, uh, Crow Tone yeah. Report and a few others. Yeah. In terms of just mindless entertainment, I, I really enjoy Black Mirror, that the whole uh, dystopian kind of yeah. kind of vibe. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think it's a good glimpse into the future as well or into the not so distant future. So yeah, I really enjoy that, that series. You would think that the writers of Black Mirror were strategic intelligence hours on how often they get things right. Yeah, totally. It's it's pretty yeah, it's pretty scary sometimes. <laughs> I I I really enjoy it, and I think you know we went. I didn't even know we went already so far in time. But any final thoughts? Anything that you would like to close off on, or anything you would recommend, or or even ask me? You know, I don't know. I think honestly, I would personally after doing what I've been doing for the last six months and, and meeting people like yourself, I think there's something to be said about, you know, putting yourself out there and s starting a following on social media, um, especially in, in our community in the intelligence and information and current events community, especially because it really helps you broaden uh, your network. And, you know, Instagram itself has, has led me to the likes of yourself and, and, Lethal Minds Journal and, and everyone who's involved with that and you know I've talked to them in person as well and they're, they're really good critical critical people if anyone's keen to get on board especially in my part of the world in New Zealand just yeah. get on board because I know there's a lot of you out there who are thinking about it but you, you don't necessarily um, I don't know have the guts <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. that's a big one that's a big one I mean you're challenging yeah, yeah. some people out there now yeah man, I am I am <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't, yeah, time's gone fast, man. It's already been an hour. Always enjoy talking to you, and I think maybe some people would like to to know about this. But we hope to to get you on board on our our intelligence courses, intelligence school mm -hmm. that we are trying to set up, and it's much more difficult than I expect it would be. And mm -hmm. particularly if you want to offer quality, it's a lot of hours and to get multiple intelligence specializations, uh, GeoInt, Imint, uh, SigInt. I don't know how much of those can be taught online or have to be taught in person, but uh, yeah, that people uh, know that Alcon will uh, hopefully be uh, uh, a good part of that, of that course that we are, that we're developing. And, and if you, if you guys have any questions reach out to Alcon S2 on, on Instagram. Is there any other place that they can reach out to you, follow you? Yeah, head to my website, subscribe at theorcongroup.com or you can email me direct info at theorcongroup.com. I'll, um, I'll always reply. I'm always available. Important. That's a great point. And maybe you will have to hire somebody in the future to do all those emails. Now you've opened the oh, yeah, gates. <laughs> I'm already, already uh, starting to experience that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, man. And I uh, really appreciate you, you staying up a little bit since you're in, uh, in New Zealand and, and I'm in Europe. But yeah, if anything, echo what you said, uh, Alcon, about yeah, putting yourself out there. And, and if you've been thinking about something, either joining the intelligence community or setting something up, you know, just do it. And, mm. you know, you, you'll meet, at least you will meet some interesting people along the way and, uh, and you will learn incredibly much by doing so. You will learn about yourself a lot mm. and uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time again and, and I speak to you. So, I mean, we, we speak very often, so yeah. And, and, and again, to reiterate guys. Yeah. Bulletin from the borderland. Um, with Lethal Minds Journal. It's on Substack. Cool. cool mate. Awesome. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Alcon, for joining us uh, today at the podcast and I uh, really appreciate you being here. Hey, guys, thank you for listening in. Please follow us on our website, www.greatdynamics.com. Great with an E. Subscribe to the podcast. Please give us 
comments, give us ratings, you know, we prefer five stars, but give us whatever you think we deserve. And I really appreciate you guys for joining in and all the support for the first podcast. And again, thank you to Alk 